All information contained in this podcast is general in nature and does not consider your individual circumstances. You should consider the appropriateness of this information with regards to your individual objectives, financial situation, and needs. Welcome to Sharing More Than The Sheets, a podcast to help you and your partner make better financial and lifestyle decisions so that you can both focus on the things that you love. I'm your host, Michael Curry, financial planner, green thumb, husband, and just dad. This podcast is part of a short series to help and encourage current and potential small business owners to improve and grow. I will be talking to experts in their fields, as well as successful business owners, and we will be discussing what they do and how they do it so well. All large corporations or businesses started somewhere. Today, I wanted to talk about taking a business to the next level and essentially going from being a you know, being a small size, um, even maybe being a startup and just expanding and looking beyond horizons to grow. I've invited Yanni Lazarou to be with us, who is currently the founding director, who has been there since day one of the coffee club. Yanni, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome, Michael. Nice to be here with you. Yeah, no, it's, um, you know, it's, if, there's no one that you'll talk to in Australia that doesn't know who the coffee club is. Um, I think you're in like nine countries. There's 400 stores, if not more or less than that. Yeah, I can't keep tabs on the numbers now. <laughs> it's, um, you know, it's, and it all started somewhere, didn't it? Like it, I'm guessing initially it wasn't 400 stores or anywhere near that. It, exactly. We started in Brisbane uh, in 1989 on the 2nd of November. Um, we started off there with the one store. My now two business partners, Emmanuel Kokoris and Emmanuel Drivers, they opened the store with the vision of being the best coffee shop in Brisbane. Uh, little did we know that when we opened our doors on that uh, rainy day and we served the first, well, I served the very first customer. Her name is Doreen Crookston, lovely lady. The, the weather was horrendous that day. It was just one of those, it was like a Friday afternoon thunderstorm, but it happened on a Thursday morning. So go figure. But um, we weren't to know how big the coffee club would get to and what the future had in store for us. Um, It's 32 years now. And like you just said, we're in nine or 10 different countries now with uh, over 400 stores uh, under the coffee club banner. Yeah. Wow. So it's, yeah. And back then I'm guessing you had no idea that things would get to where they are. Uh, Was it even a vision? Was it, um, was it even like a, a concept that you had imagined? No, not at all. I mean, look, we opened the first store, as I just said, now in, on, in November of 1989. The second store opened um, a year later, also in Brisbane CBD. And then a couple of months later, we opened the third store. Before you knew it, we had seven corporate stores, company-owned stores that we were running ourselves uh, up until July uh, 1994. And then we franchised two of those stores. And one of the biggest compliments that I can remember receiving was somebody asking, is this an American franchise? And franchising back in 1994, well, that wasn't huge unless you were a McDonald's, a KFC, a Hungry Jack's. There really wasn't much else in, in franchising and Pizza Hut, obviously. But that was very complimentary. I still remember that, the lady that asked me that. Um, and to me, that means that all of our systems we were doing properly because each store replicated the other one. And that's what the key to successful franchising is all about. Consistency is what m- makes a great franchise. Yes. Yes. And when did you, did, I mean, when, when did the concept of even becoming a franchise occur? Um, was there something that happened or was it an event that occurred or, um, or was it literally just? As I said, we had seven company owned stores and on July 1, 1994, we sold off two of our stores um to and they became franchisees uh and both those stores are actually still in trading today one's at Chermside shopping center and that's relocated about three or four times i think and the other one is at brookside shopping center at mitchelton um and again that's in the same location that it was but everything around us has changed so it's it makes me proud when i go and see those two stores yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. And then, and then after that, um, was it just like an offer that you made to to other franchisees, or you probably had franchisees coming to you? 
we had people coming we had people coming to ask um which was great you know at, at one stage throughout the years maybe in late 90s uh we had more franchisees ready to take on stores than sites that we had available and in franchising world that's a good problem to have because you can pick and choose your franchisees so yeah but um you know we couldn't get sites fast enough for those franchisees and, and i mean if, if how does in, in just thinking now of a, of a business owner, somebody that has a, let's say a successful business and they're thinking of doing the same thing. Um, I guess, what would you say would be the main points for that person to consider whether it's expanding into several of their own stores or going out and deciding to start up a franchise? Well, the first thing that that's really important is are you able to duplicate the model and the systems that you have in place of the, your successful store now? If you are, then it is a franchisable item uh, or model. So everything needs to be identical when, when you, you know, the only thing that separates the, each franchise from one another is the people running it. But we like to think that all of our people are welcoming, warm, fun-loving, um, and uh, extremely courteous to the customers and, and able to fulfill the customer's needs. Um, that's the one thing that we like to think that all of our franchisees have in common. Other than that, they've all got their own individual personalities, which, you know, you can't determine what sort of personality you want to put into the store. Um, but it does take a special person to be working in hospitality and to be passionate about it and to love it. And that's me. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. Because it's a, actually, I'll tell a funny story. So I, no one really knows this, but my first job was at a fish and chip shop, at a coffee shop. Um, I got sacked within two weeks because I just couldn't, I had no, I was terrible at doing anything with food. I, I was making mistakes left, right, and center. Right. Then I had a job at a fish and chip shop, which I had for about a month, sorry, kebab shop, which I was there for a month and got sacked as well. Um, I was then at a fish and chip shop and then I got a job at another fish and chip shop and I got sacked from one because I was working at the other, but really I think I was just really bad. And then <laughs> from that last fish and chip shop, I got sacked like three weeks later because I was terrible. So it does take a special person. And for me, hospitality is not my thing. <laughs> it's, you know, so it, you're right. I, it does, I, find, it, I find that um, interesting because you're such a personable person, you know, you, you're approachable. Um, you're always smiling, you're always happy, you're fun-loving. Um, you may not like to incorporate those uh, traits that you have working in food, so you'd rather just be walking the floor and greeting everybody and saying, g'day and how you going, and not do anything with the food. So I get that too. Yeah, well, that's a good point. I mean, I was able to you know, make up for mistakes and stuff. So I mean, no, nobody left unhappy, so probably I should have yeah. been better off at the front counter than in the kitchen. Exactly. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, different, and different horses for different horses, Michael. Definitely. Because I think after that, I got my first job in sales, like a month later selling home phones back then. It was funny. I was telling my kids the other day about what home phones are and they still couldn't understand it, but I was like, I worked selling home phones and I sold more home phones than the owner of the business within the first day, you know? So oh, there you go. You found, you found your, um, your niche. You think, yeah. And, and and as a business owner, I'm guessing, isn't that's the, the same thing. I, mean, I know we're going off on a tangent here, but so many times I see business owners who are, for example, you know, somebody could be an amazing baker, um, but a terrible business owner. Oh, sure. Of course. Look, we, we made mistakes along the ways, uh, along the way uh, throughout the course of our business. And one of the things that that we learned early on in the piece is just because somebody is a great staff member doesn't mean that they want to be what well, they would like to be rewarded and promoted into a store manager, but all their skills may lie in that person being customer service or chef or barista. It, their skills may not lie as managing other people. So what we do is we damage that person without the correct training. Now, even if you do train them, that may not be their passion. So don't think you're rewarding somebody by promoting them into a job that they know nothing about. That makes a lot of sense. And I'm guessing yeah. you, you, you've probably seen and probably made your fair share of mistakes along the way as well. Uh, absolutely, Michael. Yeah, over the years, of course. You know, but we learned that very early because, you know, just because someone's a great staff member and, you know, works wonders behind the counter doesn't mean that they're going to be a great manager. And that, that's a different set of uh, skills that's required to be a store manager as opposed to being, you know, front, front of house. Yep, that's true. And what would you say to somebody that, you know, again, is probably wanting to take things to the next level, but they're, they're too scared to do it because a lot of, some people feel failure, they fear failure. Um, yeah. Some people don't know where to begin. 
I suggest that they do tests on uh, their friends. You know, are they able to train their friends or a staff member into running the business solely and wholly? If all their modules are written down and procedures are written down properly and they can easily be taught to somebody else, then they do have a franchisable model. Now, costs, well, you're, don't forget when you become a franchise, your foundation is your franchise agreement. And that's one thing that you shouldn't skim on, skimp on. You've got to make sure that your franchise documents are, are waterproof, you know, leak proof. Yeah, that makes sense. Just to avoid misunderstandings and legal issues and exactly. all the rest of it. Yeah. Exactly. That makes sense because... Because that's yeah. what you're selling at the end of the day, your franchise documents. It's all your IP. Yes. Yes. And I, I mean, like McDonald's, for example, you know, the way they do things is amazing. Like, you know, somebody could literally, they could slot someone into the system. And again, I'm sure you're the same at your stores. You know, somebody could literally, if the system's set up properly, someone just needs to be slot into that system. Correct. And Correct. then everything just works. You are, you are doing yourself a huge favour if everything's identical and if everything is systemised uh, into modules so that if somebody, if a manager, you know, the old uh, hit by the bus scenario, someone can't make it into work, you just pull somebody out of another store or somebody that's on a day off or somebody that's on holidays that, that wants to come in and they can just run that store because it's identical to the one that they're working in. It may not be that one. These podcasts have been brought to you by Better Financial Planning Australia. To book a free 15-minute phone chat, visit betterfinancialplanning.com.au. And would you say some business models aren't franchisable? Like, for example, I don't know, let's say a lady or a man consults people on how they should groom their pets. Like, let's say dog hairstyles, for example. Yeah. Um, You Uh, know, that's that's definitely something that, that's about taste, someone's taste. But I'll give you something else that I know. I was a hairdresser before Coffee Club. I don't know if you know that. But, um, no. so yeah, I was a hairdresser. And one of the reasons that I wanted to get out of hairdressing was because the salon was named after me. I mean, my Greek name is Yanni. Most people call me John, but, you know, I answer to anything and I've been called a lot worse. <laughs> so I called the salon Yanni's Hair Design. Now, People that came, just walked past the store, the, the salon, they would come in and they'd say, oh, you know, I, I want Yanni to do my hair, but I don't know you. No, but you own the salon, so therefore you're better than anybody else that's working in here, so I would like you to do it. So all of a sudden, I've created myself to be a prisoner to that business. Now, with hospitality, it doesn't matter because you're, you're there, but you don't have to be actually serving somebody. I can just be talking to them. Somebody else could be getting their, their food. Somebody else could be getting their beverages. They know that I'm the boss and they've appreciated that the boss has had a chat with them, walked past, tapped them on the shoulder and said, is everything okay here? Can I get you something else? That's not an easy thing to do with hairdressing. And that's my point. Hairdressing is a very difficult business to franchise because it's so personable. You know, you, you go to your hairdresser because you like the way that person cuts your hair, not because of the brand. The only person that's done it successfully, and it's not a franchise, is my good mate, Stephen Ackery. Um, Stephen has just, he's done an amazing job with his business and his name where he's created uh, amazing hairdressers, fantastic business, and a very successful business all around uh, Southeast Queensland. And I take my hat off to him. And, I, and I've looked at Stefan. I know him very well. Um, I've looked at him as a role model for many, many years. And I'm thinking to myself, how on earth did he do that with hairdressing? But he promoted that brand, that name, Stefan. So people wanted to go to Stefan's to get their hair cut. And it's a byproduct that you choose somebody that's working in that salon. You're not, you know you're not going to get Stefan, but you're going to get somebody that works in that salon. So... That, that's what I'm trying to say, that not every model can be franchised and hairdressing is one of them because, of, you know, it's, it's a one-on-one uh, job, basically. That's true. And every experience is unique. Correct. It's correct. completely I different. Mean, I, I, I'm 60 years old this year and I've only ever had four people cut my hair. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Was the first one your mum? 
No. <laughs> I remember our mum used to cut our hair when we were teenagers and it was terrible and we'd go to school. I, I bet and, it was. And people would say to us, oh, who cut your hair? And I'd be too embarrassed to say it was mum. I'd be like, oh, some hairdresser, but yeah, I'll never go back to them again. No, when, when you're Greek, you've got a whole relative, so, so many relatives that are hairdressers, so it doesn't matter. Um, you know, on the point of Stefan, when you mentioned Stefan, um, you are right. Like he physically wasn't in the store, but no. his picture was on every shampoo bottle. <laughs> and, Correct. And his picture was at, at, the, at the front entrance. And that just makes me think of the customer experience, you know, um, when they first came to the store. And I mean, similar to yours, the customer experience is consistent. Nobody um, went to Stefan's expecting Stefan to cut their hair. Yep. But they knew that they were going to get somebody that's been trained very well, whether it is by, trained by Stefan or, or one of their trainers, I don't know. Although I did work for Stefan for a little while. He, his staff, they all excel. He's, he's done a beautiful job within the hairdressing industry, which is an industry that can't be duplicated. And I, he's proved me wrong because he has duplicated. You know, I don't know how many salons he's got in, in Queensland. There's got to be over 60 or 70 stores. Yeah, so many. He's, so he's going he's gonna to hear this and bring me up and say, <laughs> I've actually got this many, John. So. <laughs> but, but even the reputation is still there. Um, Correct. And again, just like the coffee club, you know, no matter how, no matter how large you've gotten, the, it still has a good reputation. And that's hard because especially in food, it's one of those, like, I mean, I don't know about you, but if I go to a coffee shop and the coffee's bad, I won't go back again. Um, right. Or if the food's terrible, I won't go back again. Yeah. Or maybe I'll go once yeah. and that's it. So to be around for a long time and to have that many stores, it's... Well, it's, it's 32 out. years and we pride ourselves, Michael, on, on ensuring that our teams that we have working within the stores are knowledgeable. They know the product. They know what our customers require. They've all been trained. If they're on a coffee machine, they've all done the training. They've all done extensive training on how to use the machine, how to grind the coffees, how to make all of our coffees, you know, how to... Uh, work out if there's a problem with the machine, they're able to fix it themselves. So they're all passionate baristas, which is a, a lot more than, you know, maybe some of the smaller suburban places where anybody gets on a machine and they think they can make a coffee. Yes, that's true. So it's not quite that easy. That's true. So, so it's even the training that's part of the model, I guess, to make sure everyone gets the same training or that they... Uh, absolutely. And like I said earlier, when I started speaking to you, consistency is the key to any successful franchise. So if you're having a coffee, what, what sort of coffee do you drink, Michael? Uh, normally espressos or doppios. Okay. So if you're having your espresso in Brisbane CBD at Eagle Street Pier and you're on a family holiday, I know I saw you up at Hamilton Island, but let's just say you're in a family <laughs> holiday in Darwin. And you see a coffee club, you're going to walk in there knowing very well or expecting that you're going to get the same coffee that you get at the coffee club at Brisbane City. Now, I'd be really disappointed if you were let down. But if you were let down, then there's a problem, you know, within the training or of that store. Or I don't know, but we would love to know about it to make sure that the, the standards of all of our products and all of our customer service and experiences is the level that we had set up when we originally started. Yes. Yes. And, and I guess, and you need to monitor this over time as well, of course. That's right. We've got plenty of people on the road that, you know, if there is a problem somewhere, they'll just, you know, walk in and, and find out what the problem is and hopefully fix it before any damage is done. Yeah. Yeah. So, so just like any business, a franchise model isn't a set and forget thing either. It's, it's a, uh, it's, God, it's, one, no, it's, it's always God, monitored no. and tweaked and we're continually evolving as well. So, you know, the training just doesn't stop once you got your franchise and say a year later, you know, because our menus evolved, um, you know, the look and feel, we're always coming up with different promotions, whether it be food or beverages, there's always something going on that, and um, all the staff need to be well aware and, and well in tune with what the latest uh, promotion is, so to speak. Yeah. And, and, and lastly, again, like I've, I've asked you this question already, but what are some final words that you've given to somebody that, again, is thinking of taking things to the next level? Um, what, would, what would you say their first step should be? The, the first, not the golden rule, but the, the, the number one first thing. Step? Okay. I, I would make sure that everybody in your store, let's just say, are we talking about a restaurant? Anything, literally. It could, Anything. Be, Joe, okay. it could be Joe's Mechanic or... All right. I would make sure that everybody that works in their store has in your store, in your business, has a description, a job description. That job description 
wouldn't be there if that position was not needed, correct? Yes. Right. So we've got, say, six staff. They've all got a job description. They all know exactly what needs to be done. When you open your second business, those job descriptions will move over to there as well because those jobs will be needed to ensure that the same quality of service is given in site number two that your original site and customers are getting. Yep. And that's, I, I can't stress that enough, the fact that if you've got more than one site, make sure that both sites are offering the same service, the same quality of service, the same product, the same price. Yep. That make, that's good advice. And so look, looking at things from a micro level, essentially, on a low level. Yes. To look at yes. the moving and then parts. Obviously, and, and then obviously, I mean, you know, the, 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 the site number one could be in a AAA location, right, a location which really can't be, you can't get again for one reason or another. So your second site may be in an inferior position, but you know that you're doing everything properly and hopefully you will attract businesses, uh, sorry, customers to that site, even though, you haven't got the same sort of foot traffic or flow of traffic like you've got in your first site, but they know exactly what they're going to get. So they make that move to come to a site that may be out of, you know, a little bit hard to get to, so to speak. Yes. Yes. That's good advice. That's good advice. And again, I can um, I employ anyone listening to this to, you know, seek the advice of a professional um, if they're looking oh, at fran- obviously. franchising their own business, because I know there's people out there that specialize in this stuff or to, contact even a franchise like yourself or, you know, franchise exactly. that, that person relates to that feels like they can maybe be part of that family as well. Michael, Michael, I'm more than happy for you to share my, um, my details, uh, my email address, which you have, yes. um, my, yeah, the email address I'm available on Facebook under Yanni Lazaru or John Lazaru, um, LinkedIn as well. And I'm more than happy to help out and, you know, to give my opinion for what it's worth. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. And, and I can see that, you know, just even making time for this um, honestly means a lot um, because I know how busy you are. My one pleasure. last thing, one last yes. thing. I like to finish all my episodes off with a dad joke. Um, yep. You've probably got a couple, um, but then I, I found a dad joke about coffee as well. All right. So um, did you hear about the hipster who burnt his tongue? No. No, he, he sipped his coffee before it was cool. That's a dad joke, man. Yeah, I know, I know. Hipster, cool. Wow. I know, I know, I know. Well, yeah, at least it's about coffee. At least <laughs> yeah. it's about coffee. <laughs> Can you think of any at the moment or not really? Um, no, I can't actually. It's 10 o'clock at night. We, so I don't we, we've been talking all week. You could have briefed me on that. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> Uh, again, thank you so much for your time, Yanni. I really appreciate it. You know, again, I'll put um, in, I'll put the the coffee club web address in the description of this episode description. And if, um, yeah, and I, I just use my John at Lazaru.co as a contact. My Facebook and LinkedIn pages, you're more than welcome to put them up as well. Perfect, perfect. Thank you so much again. Appreciate it. No worries, Michael. I appreciate it. Thanks for joining us on sharing more than the sheets. Please make sure you subscribe to be updated with future episode releases and feel free to share this episode with any friends or family that you think it might benefit. Please visit us at sharingmorethanthesheets.com.au to submit questions or requests for future podcast topics. These podcasts have been brought to you by Better Financial Planning Australia. To book a 15-minute phone chat, visit betterfinancialplanning.com.au.